Always good to remember God's provision to his world, his created world. It's not just for his children. He's a God who is generous to the righteous and the unrighteous. Such is his love uh, for people, for his creation. And food, you know, we're very fortunate in this country to have what we have. There are countries that don't have as much, have a fraction. Um, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't equipped the world with enough provision for the world. Um, Paul, in I think it's in Corinthians, talks about the fact that God has given enough food for everybody in this world. It's just unequally shared. That's the problem. Um, if people had the right heart across the world, then everybody would have enough. Because God has provided a world that can provide enough. Um, but we give thanks to God for his provision for us. And the banner, I assume is Rosie's work. <laughs> it is. Um, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Um, apart from Rosie and probably apart from Brian, does anybody know where that comes from? I, I knew which chapter it came from. I didn't know what verse, so I had to look it up. I think this is a powerful verse, James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. goes on to talk about from the Father of heavenly lights, with whom there is no shadow of turning or changing. And this is a good verse to remember. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. When bad things happen, don't blame God. Simple fact. But how many Christians do think bad things come from God? You know, we need to reevaluate our concept of God. And on the basis of James 1.17, we have to be reminded, we have to remind ourselves in the challenges of life that every good and perfect gift comes from God. When you get other things happening in your life, look elsewhere. Don't lay it at the foot of God because that's wrong, it's inaccurate, it's not biblical. But it's good to be reminded of God's provision to us and we're thankful to him. Thank you, Father, for your provision, your blessing upon our lives. We are very fortunate to live in this country. We do think of those who don't have as much as we do. May we remember them in your love. But we can be grateful. We're thankful to you for what you have provided for us. And Lord, we know that the ultimate provision for us was your son. And we give thanks for your son. So it's good to be reminded. It's good to be reminded of the word of God. And Nick's got it up there, which is good. God doesn't change. God doesn't shift. God doesn't alter. God is a constant. And that's why he's often referred to as a rock. He is my rock of refuge. He is my rock on which I can base my life because he doesn't shift. He doesn't move. He's immovable. He's constant. And we have to remind ourselves of that. We sometimes think God shifts. God moves. God fluctuates. He doesn't. That's not biblical. He is a rock. And many times, it says in the Old Testament, God is our rock. Hebrews, why did I do that in a funny voice? I don't know. Hebrews 4, 7. <laughs> why do I do many things? I have no idea. But I am who I am. Hebrews 4, 7. Therefore God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And if you look at the whole chapter, chapter 4 of Hebrews, one of the points that the writer brings out is the fact that today is always today. 
tomorrow when you read this verse, it will be today. Whenever you read this verse, it is today. It's the present. It's the now. It's this point in time that you are at. And the writer says, at this point in time that you are at today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Have a soft heart. Don't have a hard heart, an impenetrable heart, a calloused heart, a heart that is not sensitive. Don't have a heart that rejects, but have a heart that is sensitive and soft to the voice you hear. Now the question is, in this passage, whose voice is his voice? And helpfully, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, because he opens the book of Hebrews with these verses, and you will then know who his voice is. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by the Son. And it's the Son's voice. The whole of Hebrews is about Jesus and his superiority in so many aspects. But it's his voice. Jesus' voice. And so if we go back to 4-7, today if you hear his voice, today if you hear Jesus' voice, do not harden your heart. If you think as a Christian that you do not have a hard heart, you would have to think again. Because we all have hard hearts in some area of our lives, perhaps in many areas, towards the Lord and if you think that's not possible for a Christian to have that then you only have to look at the life of the disciples especially after the feeding of the 5,000 and then the subsequent crossing over the stormy sea and seeing Jesus walking on the water you will see in there that Jesus says to his disciples you have hard hearts so believers can have hard hearts and the exhortation here from the writer to Hebrews is to the people, to us, today when you hear the Lord's voice, do not have a hard heart. Be sensitive to him. Listen to him. Take on board what he says. Receive what he says. Let it come into your inner being. Let it work within you. Don't reject it. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be calloused towards God, towards the Lord but have a soft heart. And you can go off and you can look into Hebrews 4 as to what constituted a hard heart. Unbelief constituted an aspect of a hard heart. But that's not what I want to focus on because as I was reading this, and I've been reading the book of Hebrews recently, is this phrase, his voice. Today when you hear his voice, when the Lord speaks and that sort of led me on a bit of a journey into sort of well his voice the importance of it and how does it apply what can we learn and the thing to bear in mind is we are starting in the New Testament uh, Hebrews is considered to be a, a, lat a later written book perhaps to sex uh, second generation believers but as I said, his voice. And I got led all the way back to the Old Testament, to Exodus 23. And these are the verses in Exodus 23. And I think these are very powerful verses. And uh, there's a simplicity about it. And there's an, uh, something about it which I found quite profound. And uh, we read. See... 
This is God speaking. I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. The Israelites had left Egypt. They had now crossed the Red Sea. They were now a nomadic people, a large number of people. And God says, I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you and to bring you to the place I have prepared. And the place that God had prepared for the Israelites was the land of Canaan, uh, a land considered by God to be a land of milk and honey, a land of blessing, a land of prosperity, a land of fruitfulness. And so the Israelites were being taken from the captivity of Egypt through the desert into the wonderful freedom and prosperity and blessing of their own territory, their own country. And we know the story. And God says about the angel that's being sent ahead of them. He says, pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. You could say, do not have a hard heart. He will not forgive your rebellion. This is Old Testament. Since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. We're going to the next section, please, Nick. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. But... Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessing blessing, will be on your food and your water. That's a powerful blessing. The blessing of provision in food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. That's a powerful blessing. I will take sickness from among you. None will miscarry or be barren in your land. You will be fruitful. And I will give you a full lifespan. Now, look at those blessings. Hands up those who would like those blessings. And I'm going to put my hand straight up and I say... I just think that's powerful. I want a blessing on my food and my water. Water into wine, yeah, that would be a nice thing. I want no sickness. I want sickness taken away from me. I don't want it. I want this promise. Miscarrying or being barren, well, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> I'm not worried about that bit. I will give you a full lifespan. Do I want a full lifespan? I want a biblical full lifespan. I don't necessarily want a long life, but I do want a full life. And I think there's a difference. Many people live long, but in their latter years, they become, well... They just lose their mind or their faculties or, th- or their health. But here there is a promise. I will give you a full lifespan. I will give you a full life. From beginning to end, you will have a full life. So here we have tremendous promises of provision, of health, and of a full life. And for those who are interested won't miscarry or you won't be barren. You'll be fruitful. And I think that's powerful. Isn't that succinct? Isn't that to the point? Doesn't that sort of encapsulate what a person desires? And the thing to remember about this is this is written in Exodus. Exodus 23. 
you know your Bible, you know that the Ten Commandments are in Exodus 20, three chapters earlier. So this has been spoken to the people quite quickly after the Ten Commandments, what we would consider part of the law has been given to the Israelites. And we would say that because this is Old Testament, they are living under the Old Covenant. They are under the covenant of law. They are not under the covenant of grace. They're Old Testament, Old Covenant people. And yet, isn't it staggering that under an old covenant, these verses could be written? I think they are powerful under an old covenant. Now, was God true when he said this? Well, of course he is. God is true even though every man's a liar, Paul says in Romans. God is true. Jesus said, I am the truth the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the truth. What I say is true. Now we started off in Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, today if you hear Jesus' voice, listen to him. Don't harden your heart towards him. If we go back to the... That's good. You're there. <laughs> oh, no, the previous bit. I think That's it. And uh, so in Hebrews it says, uh, today if you hear his voice, today if you hear Jesus' voice. And the writers of the Hebrews were speaking to those under the new covenant. And this is under the old covenant. But God here says, see I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way. And to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him. Listen to him. And do not rebel against him. Listen to him and do not harden your heart. Listen to him and do not rebel. Listen to him. I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Who's the angel? Who's the angel? you get a very big clue, I think, as to who this angel is. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion. God is speaking in this passage, and notice what he says. Since my name is in him. My name is in him. This angel, and we tend to sort of think of uh, angel in a specific way but the actual Hebrew just means messenger see my messenger my communicator I will send my messenger my communicator ahead of you and God goes on to say my name is in him so this is a very special angel who is going ahead of the Israelites to which God has said, or to the Israelites, God has said, listen to this person. But when God says, I have put my name in him, what does that mean? Well, name, from a biblical viewpoint, doesn't just mean what somebody is called. Name is always far more significant than that. Name always means character, on the whole. The personality, the character who the individual is, what their attributes are, what their personality is. Very rarely does it refer to actually just what somebody is called. Names are very special in the Bible. They have meaning, they have purpose, they have point. So whenever somebody says the name, so often in the Bible it's not referring to what somebody is called, it's referring to the character of that person the personality of that person, the attributes of that person. You get that from the name Jesus. Jesus was given the name Jesus because God saves. Names in the Old Testament, Abram was changed to Abraham, Sarah to Sarah, Saul to Paul, Peter to Cephas, Because names are important. They mean something. 
And so when God says here, I have... My name is in him. God is saying all of me is in that individual. And I believe there's only one person who fits that attribute. The second person of the Trinity. So who's going ahead of the Israelites? The second person of the Trinity. What did Hebrews say? Today when you hear his voice, Jesus' voice. What is said here? Listen to what he says. Who's the he here? The second person of the Trinity. Because God's name is in him. And you see, as you look into this, how powerful it is. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion. As I say, this is old covenant, so this has to be seen in the old covenant terms. But he does go on to say, if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies, will oppose those who oppose you. Into the next section, if you listen to what he says, if you don't rebel against him, if you do not bow down to the gods of these heathen nations, but if you worship the Lord your God, then his blessing will be on your food and water. Sickness will be taken away from among you. None will miscarry or be barren, and I will give you a full lifespan. There are striking similarities between aspects of the new covenant and aspects of the old covenant, what is said here. Because if you look at it, God and his son speak, give information. And if you do not rebel and do not harden your heart, listen to him, worship him, then these blessings will be upon you. Now, as I said, this is old covenant. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, I want what the Israelites had here what was available to them I want that I want the blessing on my food and water I want sickness to be taken away from me I don't want any of that I want a full life and I think we can all agree this is what we want and this is old covenant so it was available to them and as I was reading this I was thinking if you take this passage, and if you read it, and I thought to myself, could I do what is said in this passage? If I was an Israelite living at the time, would I be able to accomplish what is said in this passage? To get the blessings that are there, would I be able to fulfill the conditions? And I thought to myself, I thought, well, I probably could. And I'm not being arrogant there, I'm just looking at it and thinking, you know, there's all the Israelites, the, this has been given to them, and if I compared myself with all the others, I'd think, well, yeah, we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all human beings, we're Israelites, we're being led by the Lord. And here God is speaking to us, and God says, well, if you listen to what the angel says as he leads you, if you're sensitive to him, if you don't rebel against it, well, could I listen to what the Lord says in that situation? Would it be possible to do that? And I thought, well, I could probably give that a good crack, probably give that a good go. All of us as Israelites, we could give that a good go. I thought, well, that's probably possible. And into the next section, uh, it talks about you must uh, worship the Lord your God. Uh, do I worship the Lord my God? Well, I think I do. You know, I give that a good crack as well. don't have a problem with idols, or if I do, I should sort of probably knock them down. If the Lord reveals that, you know, don't have anything to do with that, I'd probably have a good go at that. So what I was thinking as I read this, I thought from an old covenant perspective, if I was part of the Israelites under this old covenant, would I be able to do this? And I thought, well, I would probably have a very good go at that. I think that would be achievable. 
do you think it would be achievable for you? Would you have a good go at it? And yet this is the old covenant. And I thought, actually, given the simplicity of this, I think I'd like to be under the old covenant. Because I like this. I like what this passage says. It's clear. It's succinct. I'd love that. I could do that. I'd have a go at that. What are the Israelites moaning about? What are they grumbling about? They've been given a great word here. I thought, I'd like that. But as I was mulling that, I said, the Lord said to me, yeah, but that's the old covenant. And you, you want to be back in there? You want to be back under that? Yeah, the Lord, I can get those blessings. I want the full life. I want the health. I want the provision, the blessing. I want that. Under the old covenant, do you want that? Well, it sounds pretty good to me. But you see, if that's our thinking, and it was, went through my mind, that's wrong. And I can tell you why it's wrong, because if we go back to Hebrews, we bounce back into the book we started off in. We read this. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs. And it's talking about the priestly ministry of Jesus in this concept. It, the ministry Jesus has is superior to the priests of the old covenant. As the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. Now we know this, but sometimes we have to be reminded of it. And I had to be sort of, not necessarily reminded, but brought back to this. The new covenant is vastly superior to the old. Vastly. And you only have to look through Hebrews to find out why the new covenant is vastly superior. Because part of the point of Hebrews is to explain the superiority, the tremendous significance of who Jesus is and what he has achieved and what the new covenant is all about. And the new covenant is superior to the old one and the new covenant is founded on better promises. So what we have under the new is vastly superior to what they had under the old. And yet, what was written in Exodus 23 is old covenant and I think is pretty good. Therefore, it f absolutely follows that what is written there has been magnified in intensity and what is available to us under the new covenant. It has to be. It can't not be. Because what's written under the old is old covenant. And that is powerful stuff. It's actually said of the Israelites, and I think it's said in the Psalms, that their clothes didn't wear out, their legs didn't swell, they didn't go blind, that they were healthy all the way through the wilderness. God kept his promise. And, he, and that was probably even considered that the fact that people didn't actually probably uphold their side of it, because they, well, they did dreadful things, really. But God showed his love to them. Now, if what's available under the old covenant is powerful, and I want it, I want the blessing on the food and the water, I want the full life, I want the health, and if that was available under the Old Covenant and was possible there, and I think achievable, how much more must it be achievable and possible under the New Covenant? It must be. Otherwise, the whole deck of cards falls, the house of cards falls. When we go back to the Old and think, well, that was better. It can't be better than the New Covenant. It just it doesn't work. The new covenant is vastly superior to the old in so many, many, many respects. 
but ask yourself the question, where are we going wrong? If under our new covenant, we are not appropriating the blessing on the food and the water, the full life and the health, you might say you are. Praise God for that. Wonderful. I don't think I've got into the sort of into that yet what's available to me but I tell you we are under a vastly better covenant than the old one and yet as I was reflecting on Exodus 23 I thought I'd like to be under that that would be quite good nice and simple and I get those blessings and God had to remind me look you are under a better covenant better promises Therefore, what we have available to us is vastly better. And yet what they had was very good. So what we have must be very, 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 very good. But do we get it? For myself, no, I haven't got to that point. And that's why I thought, well, maybe it'd be good to be under the old covenant. But that's wrong. It's wrong thinking. I've got to understand more of the new covenant. I've got to get my head around it. I've got to see what's available. You see how I get it. See, see what am I missing? I'm missing something. There's gaps in my knowledge, my theology, my... Yeah, I've got things... I haven't quite got them right. Because I think what's available in Exodus 23 is more so available to us now. Amen.